everybody, and welcome to another episode of Table Breakers. So, uh, for those that tuned in last week, we are going to be doing the uh, game next Thursday. Uh, unfortunately, Bear did have a uh, previous engagement, so uh, we are uh, kind of doing a little bit and. This is actually something I've been I've been working on for a while. Backstage, I was kind of showing TCG and Kai some of the stuff that I've been working on. And I, I, I said, Kai, this is your influence. You can see this, right? This is your influence. And you're, yes, yes, I can. So we're going to actually dig into world building. And the first big thing with world building is geography so geography is a crucial aspect of world building in tabletop rpgs the environment in which the game takes place can have significant impact on gameplay the characters and I'm gonna say the word I'm gonna say the word story what no Yes, yes, I said it. Oh. Uh, the geography of your world can affect everything from the types of creatures that live there, the types of resources that are available, and the people who inhabit it. Understanding the geography of your world is essential in creating a rich and immersive gaming experience. So, gentlemen, uh, both Kai and TCG, you both have got uh, some pretty heavy experience under your under your belts with building your own worlds, uh, and even you know TCG. I mean, you're building an entire game system on top of it. So, <clears throat> with that being said, what types of and I'm going to start with TCG what types of correlations are do you need to make sure you're making between the you know as I, as i read off in that little intro thing uh you know for the resources for the creatures that live there and for for the folks who inhabit it you know what are some of the mind mindsets and, and steps that you take to filter through all that and to figure out, you know, who goes where and what goes where and, and things along those lines? Well, as a lot of people, I take inspiration from um, real world for a lot of that kind of stuff. Like if I'm going to put in a mountainy environment, especially if it's cold, I'm going to make them a little bit of the more mountainy. They usually have long beards. They usually wear furs. If you take off their shirts, they look more muscular because they're used to working in harder conditions. Uh, I'll use that atypical for the people and for the environment itself. It kind of depends on um, how high the mountains are and how I want them to look. It, it, I like using environment to inform how an area might feel to you as a player like i kind of failed during a little game to explain the island a little bit better i just showed a map and called it good i should have given a little bit better explanation that had a kind of a mystical property what i usually do is like what, I, what I should, i'll actually give the island as an example as you come up on the island you see it's greener than you would expect for an island it's actually a little bit more almost not luminescent, but almost like it shines a little bit. The island itself also has a feel of being more of a presence than you would normally expect from an island of its size. And okay. as for the creatures, right. sorry. Go, no, keep going, keep going. I, I love uh, using creatures based off of how the environment should feel. Like, um, if I'm wanting an environment where you are constantly annoyed, I will you I will hunt down books and try to make sense of big, at least insects of some kind, preferably big ones, that come in and annoy you. Not necessarily cause you a lot of problems, but will annoy you. 
I love insects for that. But if I'm looking for a more dark forest, you'll get more of the uh, hunting, stalking type predators, the ones that you will just see on the corner of your vision. And so I, I will put things into the environment based off the feel I want the environment. But especially given I, the Palladium guy, they have a lot of world books. I still stick with, you at least try very hard to stick with what's in that section of the world book. Excellent example, we in Sloth Jungles. They don't really have any of the nice mountain predators I like to use occasionally from the northern end of this, of the continent. So I don't use them as much as I like to because they can really give a good spooky, I don't like it here vibe. But there are other creatures that not quite as good because the northern creatures are really creepy. But the uh, so other creatures can still give you a nice eerie feeling if you uh, play them off right. So I, my environment is based off of the location of the world that I'm that you are in and the vibe I'm trying to give you as the player. Okay. Kai, what about you? This is about the, this is about the environment I, I use, correct? Correct. The, the geography, the, the, you know, like the ecosystems, the people that, that you're going to be putting in there, what resources are available in those different areas, etc. Honestly, the idea at that point is, is, is simply a realization of what the, where, where most people tend to want to live, want to live. You know, I hate the idea that you're just going to be looking at, you know, Basic idea is is the land arable? How good is the resources? Can I what I what's the, what, what's in the area? So therefore, it's a lot, it's a good chunk of civil engineering. What I am, what's in the area? Who's how's trade going to happen? Is is it water? Is it water land based? Because I'm going to just go that most people have to actually live there. How far? How far can someone walk in a day? Like how far will the average person move? To, you know go to travel so that determines out the, the the kind of people in the area and that will and then you can start going okay this is what the, i'm this is the farming this is the crafting this is what's available what's what resources here's what the people have probably for i uh, for their culture is it is it equatorial is it temperate or is it um more arctic that will i that will affect things and then I realized most people don't live where there's no water. So therefore, if you don't have water, no one's going to be there. So we desolate. Why would anyone be there? Well, savage people who are, you know, I, and then you just kind of go based on the idea. I hate to say that just open, like, I don't want to say go do some research and, re and read because that will be kind of boring. And yeah, I know, um, some books are for, I are not exactly in favor for cultural development, but you gotta follow. I follow the line, so therefore, if you're not gonna have a people who, if you plunk them in the middle of a great plains, who don't have access to trees, hills, mines, or anything like that, they're not going to be like, well, of course we're gonna build a massive civilization that has advanced engineering. No, they don't have any of those resources. All they got are um, tree. Uh, like plants and wandering this you don't get you don't get that or hey everything's just misery filled swamps and jungles you don't see a lot growing in those kind of regions that are expansive unless they do something very very weird and very special and they stand out but it's i mean i will do a lot of that kind of work because well i mean it just means that you just gotta realize, well, you live in an environment where plants grow really fast. It's hot, humid. What happens in hot, humid environments? Decay. What happens there? Metal rusts. Oh dear God, metal rusts. Well, I water. I, I water is your enemy. Therefore, and it's like it's a lot of these questions that all span out to you. Really, just you really can't say I want Rome, but it's happening in the I in the Arctic Circle. No, not gonna happen. Or maybe it does, but you got to figure out the differences between what allowed for the Roman Empire to exist, to have a Roman culture, but now you're putting it in a land where you only get three months of growing per year because it's cold and miserable. So how do you get um, not Vikings, but 
expect you know ice romans to happen you don't but hey you might be able to make it work i and this is I just feel a lot targeted of, what was that i feel targeted look my ice people in my game are romans okay now you need to figure out how you you need to do a lot of work to figure out and explain how you get Roman culture to develop in a land of cold and misery. I did not know you were doing this, so I'm going to target you now. Oh no, no. I got it. I got it. They found hot springs, so they build bathhouses. Okay, geo a lot of geothermal, and you just now. And I'm pretty sure that you'll find a way to get around. Okay, so they have some way of doing vast agriculture and the ability to draw upon a large, you know, civilian population that somehow will have to be supported by the frigid Arctic land of very, very foul fish in cans. So, <laughs> hey, foul I mean, I did... I did the exact same thing where I where I decided to drop my and drop my world's version of of the Byzantine Empire up into the Arctic until one day I realized up until the, the northern latitudes of what would be New England's climate and then I had to realize oh fuck how did this develop how did this function because I just airdropped a culture and language into that area and then went oh shit how to how make it work and i had to do a lot of reverse engineering because i because i was being dumb and but i hate but i hate retcons so i filled in all the holes and yes i know the reason why i'm making fun of this is because i did it and then went oh that was dumb well already did it must make it work and ran with it so yeah like i said just do your homework so you don't do what I did and make a complete grand fuck up, but no one else notices because you do all the work in the background. Sweat hard today so you can relax tomorrow. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, you, you kind of touched on this, Kai. <clears throat> so I'm going to swing back around to you. All righty. Uh, the how... Uh, how do how does the geography affect the people and creatures that live in those regions? I mean, you've kind of touched on that just a little bit. Kind of kind of dig in. Okay. So in one of the two worlds that I predominantly run around in, I have a, this when I first drew it, it made sense, but then I had to figure out how it worked. And then I figured out how ocean currents I I Started doing how the world's ocean currents and um, and major uh, I major rain patterns happened, but I oh god we're I wish I could show it off better because I only have one thing re remaining of it. Uh, let me see if I can do this real quick. Um, okay, so I have a globe that I painted. See this? Okay, on this little m map. God, I hate this thing so much, but I love it because it allows me to measure out distances. Now, on the middle of this continent, there's a huge lake that runs from uh, a series of lakes that runs from north to south of it, and a mountain range and jungles. And I had to figure out how to do all that. And like, how's this monstrous continent-sized inner uh, inner freshwater ocean exist? And how's it? What's feeding this monstrous lake that that that, that, feed, that bleeds off in two directions into the ocean at all times? And I'm like, well, okay, but no, that established and established the idea that okay, this is a massive in, uh, uh, inner uh, inner sea area where, 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 where which has floating cities, giant, uh, you know, but it was but it, it was humid, like it's just warm and wet and humid and well. Anybody else who, who live anywhere that's warm, wet, and humid knows everything decays fast. And it's like like everything rusts unless you constantly keep it oiled and well maintained. Clothing just disintegrates, so it's like everything's literally in this made of stone and stone and wood and constantly being rebuilt. Like, is there a forest fire? No. Is there constant flooding? Yes. Is there water? 
Is there waterborne monsters everywhere? Yes. How do the people exist in this? Well, you, well, obviously this is a wet, miserable environment where it's constantly raining because there's this I, I, there's this ridge of hills that so this monstrous wet front is constantly blowing moisture in from the ocean, so it's constantly wet and miserable. But it's hitting it, it's hitting this rain shield of mountains that dumps the rain onto the so there's just constant streams and rivers everywhere. So there's bridges everywhere. The people realize that the land is just full of fungus, disease, and monsters. So they all have so they've built way stations that as far as one man can walk. Um tw- you know, like so like how far can how, how far can a man I uh, how how far can a human walk with carrying a pack of, of material in one day on a road? Nobody goes off road because you go off road, it's quicksand, swamps, and marshes. Nobody wants to walk across that shit. So at about every 20, about 13 to 20 miles, there's a way station. It's a fortified way station. Is it a real town? No. But these are fortified way stations that are built on built on stilts above the ground. And, and they have armed armed rangers who sit there and watch, you know, watch, you know, they'll, they'll haul your wagons up into the, you know, out of the muck so that way they're safe for the night. Because they know once night falls, that's when all the weird creatures come out, and come to, you know, come morning, you know, everyone gets ready, gets cleaned up. They lower your wagons down, and you're allowed to go back off onto the, you know, onto the road. It's like adventurers who are stupid go out there and go, I don't need to stop at a way station. We're gonna power march, and then they find themselves stuck out in the wilderness, and well, all the, all the logs are wet, so you can't get, you know, dry tin, I tinder to go build your own fire. There's there's bugs everywhere. Things are de- like the smell of decay is just continuous. And then you reach it. And then after four or five days, you reach a town, an actual real town. And these towns are fortified. They're built on stilts, and they're just because you don't know when a flash flood's going to hit, or you know, some weird monster's going to come walking out. So every town is built dedicatedly fortified. And it's like, oh, I'm just going to go live out. It's like, and like there are farms, and like it, like you see like. And in that area, the parts that have been civilized and pacified and cleaned up start to resemble like, like the like the Dutch or the Netherlands, where they have massive dikes and huge windmills, but they're always guarded because they're pumping out the water that's constantly seeping in, so that way they can have farms because they want to have civilization in this continent that would otherwise be be vast swamps of nothingness. So they're constantly fighting this endless war eternally against the encroaching of Mother Nature, which Mother Nature wants to wants to reclaim everything. And when you're playing in a realm where you have gods of nature who literally go, I find civilization to be abhorrent. And I dislike greatly the idea that these mortals, these Mortys, are showing up and cleaning up my region this is my land i'm going to unleash whatever i want upon these people because you know they're gods you are uh, you're under their effect but they have they have limited means and you have ways to fight them and so oh i'm fighting against the dark gods no you're just fighting against the the local river god and local rain god and the local jungle god who all hate you because you're diverting their river and their nature and they're out to stop you. But don't worry, you want to keep you and your 8,000 civilians alive in this town. Every once in a while, you lose, and the town goes away, and then people come in and rebuild it. Or you go on to the great, to the vast, the vast inland sea, where you have people praying to the, the local inland ocean god, because they don't want Neptune's out. Neptune, by whatever name you want to call him, is out there in the salty water land. We don't deal with him. But we're in the inland sea where we can't see the shore anymore and it's the ocean but now it's an inland ocean god and hey look a giant snake it's decides to eat one of the boats oh we better have convoy tactics because you know inland water crack and decides to eat people we don't want to fight the fight the godzilla uh, crocodiles but we need to get to that to that island over there that has all the civilization so you have like so it's fun the idea of medieval convoy tactics of naval and you have specialized you know adventurers who dive into the water to fight underwater monsters because well 
sorry, this isn't this isn't our modern world where you just could build a you know three deck grand a uh, grand sailing ship and go nothing's above the, you know nothing's above I'm below the waves everything is above the waves no we live in a, I, you have flying shit so you have people who are building ballistas that can shoot down thunderbirds and you have you have people who are underwater plus you have who knows what the heck I what the heck weird mong- I, I, mangrove forest that you're dealing with that just size it grow fast and now you have an un, a changing what you know a changing constant um shoreline so you can't just go well i have these 20 year old I, rudders they'll get me where i need to go crunch ah bloody and you know it's it it's like it allows for high se- high seas adventure and a sea in a freshwater environment which was still which still hates you and, will, and is out to devour your ship and murder you and you know because water has liquefied hate anyway like like myself the there there's one book series that i've been really drawn to over the past year year and a half uh and and kai i've sent it to you so don't worry (laughs) um uh it's hugh fights with monsters so it's kind of it's kind of a parallel universe uh parallel earth but it's different uh and about once every 10 years they have what they call a monster surge that happens it's a release of magical energy and all these magic critters you know pop up and and they have to go out and and take care of them and they actually have you know bunkers set up in most major metropolitan towns and you know heavy, heavier fortified towns to keep people safe i would think that would definitely be something that would be a geography type thing also is knowing that okay the the surge is coming the bad stuff's coming uh we need to we need to get to over to a town and a half of, you know a town over that's a three-day ride and and hopefully we don't you know expire going there from the monsters attacking and get into the shelters until things you know blow over and then we go back to our little houses and we rebuild and we're good for another 10 10 15 years you know and you know that's that's something else that is more i think on the mystical side is where i would call that where you know that is also something that that goes into geography because it may it's it's kind of like a you know if, if you live down in the southern u.s you know with hurricanes hurricanes don't come in and hit you know the same places every single year sometimes they do sometimes they veer off and maybe they they don't hit florida or the carolinas Maybe they go up and hit New York. Maybe they they swing around and hit Mexico. Maybe they swing around and just you know put Texas under you know six feet of water. That's- you know, the, and and but those are the type of things also where the geography and you know and we'll get into more climate and weather type stuff. But I'm using those for instances. You know where. You know the geography sometimes yeah things happen every single year as it is you know oh every year in in the in the in the you know 10th month of the year we're you know at the end of it we're going to see our first snow because we're up in the mountains and that's when that comes so we need to make sure that you know we have everything pulled in and in all the crops in everything's ready to go for winter because we're not going to have a place to to you know to uh to farm as big you know maybe that's how those those uh those ice romans as you put it in uh crafting gamers game they've built domes uh from you know the heat and are able to grow food you know not as much but you know grow food year round that could be a, a a use of geography and you know how the geography affects the people in that region uh i, I kind of stole something from you there tcg and i apologize if that's where you were what you were going to say but uh since we since we're picking on 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 your ice romans that's that's where we're going to keep going 
That's um, fine. Sorry, but not the. <laughs> So, so with you, how, how how does your geography affect the people and creatures that live in those regions? Oh, uh, in every way imaginable, honestly. Like, geography will play a huge part in how people will hunt, how people will gather their supplies, uh, how people will just simply do their day-to-day -day life. Like, uh, someone needs to go over to another village they will uh, use the geography of the land, not just like for the road, but like for the journey itself. Like, okay, if I take this particular route, I have a good chance of getting attacked by bandits. But this area, you know, though it's not actually set up for a road, it's clearer than most places, so I can get through there. And I'll be less likely to be attacked. And then there's the creatures themselves. A lot of creatures, at least in my games, will purposely set up ambush spots in good places at the, at the top of a cliff right at the to the point that uh, some some places do not have roads at the bottom of cliffs because it's a good place to get ambushed by a predator and then there's uh let's see here and then there's uh geography like this was inspired by a show i once seen as a kid but it was a really good concept and then there's a uh, natural phenomenon that is considered part of the geography of the land the show itself showed a well long long story long story short itself showed uh how a land could have a gigantic monster roaming about it destroying things in it and yet it's considered part of the natural features of the land not an actual monster So I, I've done that with a couple of things like, uh, I think, no, it wasn't a dragon. It was a dragon-like creature, but it was uh, more the equivalent of a fae. As long as it lived, the land pro uh, prospered. But if it died, the land died with it. You've been talking to Kano a lot. With the magic dragons and the dragons die out, the magic dies out. <laughs> Let's see here. I know where I was going with that, but I sidetracked myself and forgot what I was saying. Okay. What was the question again? Uh the how do how does the geography in your world affect the people and creatures that live within those regions? Oh right, right, right. Well, going a little more towards um, creatures themselves, if the if the geography supports um, will support will could support birds, I'll actually put a lot more birds in the area than I will other creatures. Not necessarily as an annoyance, but it just makes sense. Like, excellent example. The um, I forgot if it was in a Palladium game or Rift's game, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I uh, put the uh, the birds that burrow into soft rock into the game. Nobody really noticed until the well, no, they didn't notice at all actually when the birds flew off because they were supposed to be a natural sign of the land that something was wrong was about to happen. Wow, Six Nations, wow. When I, uh, when I <laughs> that's funny. When I, uh, told the characters that the, all the blur birds flew out of the cliffs at the same time, nobody responded. But it was meant to be a geographic warning to the players. Maybe a hunter there, or maybe you know a predator was close. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I do remember them ignoring the warning. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll start repeating Kai. I can't say much more than that, honestly, because. Okay, that's not a big deal. Um. 
now some of the other stuff I don't think we really touched on uh, is you know we, we touched on a little bit of, of it you know the you know mountainous regions you know maybe a cooler climate uh, yeah. and receive more participation Per, per, precipitation. I can't talk tonight. You can ask these guys pre-show. I was my tongue was just like doing knots on itself. Uh, for example, you know, uh, it'll get you know more rain than and snow than what a desert region will, and you know it'll affect the types of you know plants and animals that would be there. You know, whereas at like the base of the mountain, it, you know, it's going to be very lush because of all the water runoff. You know, and, you know, you're going to find, you know, in the desert more, you know, of the cacti and drought resistant plants. And, you know, you'll find at the base of the mountain, you know, and the, on the mountain in the base of the mountain, more alpine type meadows and coniferous trees. So I don't know. now. We, we, we talked a little bit about how the people and creatures are, uh, you know, affected. What about resources? Because in order for, for these people to live in these areas, you also have to take a look at resources. How are these people going to live? How are they going to be able to, you know, provide food for themselves, you know, get lumber, you know, if they're in a in a area where you know necessar not necessarily they're able to, you know, do all that. Now uh, we'll start with uh, TCG to, on this one. Let's see here, resources. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Usually resources end up playing a background for most of the game I play because most time the players don't usually care. So uh, after I did for a while, but I didn't put as much effort as into it after a while. Uh, but one of the things I do like to do is think about what the area has in the end, even if the players aren't interested, because it's got there does have to be something like a. Uh, We'll go with my game for an excellent example. Kai has asked several times about different points of the economy in my game, especially like the lumber needed for um, building ships. I decided not to make it that rare because otherwise ships could get ridiculously expensive out, outside of the means of a player being able to get because they already cost millions to have. So... I had to think about other things that could be built on top of resources that cities might build. So one of the things that came out for that in my game is ice and salt is one of the, there's the two big ones that people will build cities around. Water is a, is another good one, but that's usually for the per personal use of the city. Ice is generally very rare in this game because most things stay at an altitude of, um, well, pretty low by our standards. So, Ice buildup isn't not that common. The only place that is common is under the purple sun, but that's because it's the ice sun. Everything's frozen there. And salt. I I didn't think about it at first, but I thought about it after a while. There is, especially in a world where you can spend months without seeing an island, you have to have preservatives. So I thought about it and figured salt would be extremely valuable, especially given the fact that the island, the ship, the, the, the world is built up in islands. Therefore, finding a gigantic salt deposit is going to be very rare. So I actually have, I, I haven't added it to the book yet, but I intend to add a city that's literally built on a salt mine. It's one and only purpose is to exist, is to mine salt. There will be another city that's built off of ice alone. And I've had to put a lot more thought into this for my games as of late because I'm building my own game. So resources is something that I have not put as much effort into as I should have until recently. So 
so uh, I, I always did at least a little background for that. Every town always had, well, they're a lumber town or they're a mining town or, well, they're the uh, in-between point for the Dwarven city and the human city over here. So they get a lot of traffic from both. Uh, there's always been a reason for a city to exist is how I should put this. I just never put as much effort into it as till recently because most of my players never really interested. We're never really interested. And I will start repeating myself if I continue. Okay. So, uh, in, 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 I, for, for me as uh, on the player side, I find it really kind of scary that your players don't look at that more just for the simple fact of the to know what they can get that that's the that's the big thing because you know you're not going to be able to go buy you know everything in one in every town you know type of thing so you're gonna kind of need to know what you got and and for supplies and all that i mean you're gonna have some some things that are going to be more of the uh oh yeah 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 we, we we've got this 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 and this here that's great but then you know you're you're gonna say okay well in this region you know this area they have an abundance of this so where you could theoretically especially with the way your game is set up you could have a very uh, uh swarthy captain Go really? You guys have an overabundance of this. I could buy some of that, take it to a place that I know doesn't have a lot of this, that I could really make some profit on. Yeah. And you know, I, I I'm I'm not trying to to sound like the the uh, the guy who uh, sits back with the spreadsheets and the abacus and and tried to you know. Oh well, we go from point A to point B, over to point C, and then come and just keep doing that little, little soiree, and and we're we're gonna make all of our money. Uh, but you know, hey, the, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, well, hey, I well, it, I, admittedly, Kai, Kai saying that he didn't want to be a spritch. Sorry, give me my airship elite dangerous game where all I do is play. Is play I, I merchants and caravans in the air as though I'm playing traveler. I back <laughs> off. Give me the collapse of the third imperium slash fifth border wars, and I'll be happy. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to ask ask the price of toilet paper in China. Thank you very much. Well, see, we've already called TCG out on his, so I had to call you out on yours. But I am a I am but, a special. But, <laughs> I, I, and I and trust me, I know that, and that's the only reason why I brought that up. But the but I mean, and and looking at you know, especially if they are invested, that's the biggest thing when you're doing world building. You want to make sure that you actually get things set up so they're invested, so they want to find out what's going on or what they could do to make some money. Because I'm sorry, I have yet to see. At any type of adventuring party, minus maybe some of the murder hobos, I'll, 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 I'll give them that. But where they want, don't want to try to figure out, hey, how can I make some cash? Is there anything I can craft that I can sell here? You know, even in a small amount that's going to be, you know, going to going to bring in a little of that moolah, or you know, help help grease some of the. Uh, the gears here so we can uh, make some trades and stuff maybe later on you know that's that's the type you know and maybe i'm just you know i'm a little slightly different but those have been a lot of the groups i've been with and uh that that has always come you know especially with the immersion and especially when you're building a world you want to have a certain sense of immersion and trying to find out what what the economy is like, yeah. You know, there, 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 there's there, there's three things that you always want to find out in, in a world: the economy, the culture, 
as in what 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 are the cultural norms what are the things that are going to be get you looked at really not nicely and religion those are the three things that you always want to look at because you don't want to upset the 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 folks the the priest type folks because they're going to be supplying you with with the healing and getting you back on your feet you don't want to Work off the the locals because even you know two hundred people with pitchforks can kill a you know good level player you know <laughs> and three you know is learn what makes the economy work so you can make it work for you and, and as the as some people uh, like to point it work smarter not harder so. Uh, the uh, and now uh, Kai, what about you? What, what what do resources look like in your games? Okay, so you have the basic you have basic fish common resources. So you know your standard lumber, your standard iron. Where unless you're living in a very iron poor region, you know you're not Japan. So even they have iron river iron veins in their mountains. So. Most people have access to your basic, uh, to your basic bitch I, I, items, where you uh, like your woods, your grains, your um, your peats, your your straws, your hays, your basic lumber's, basic uh, metals. But the fun part always come for because we live in uh, I we play video game I, and we play RPGs and video games that have special re special resources. So you always have those weird like so at that point it all comes down to. If you don't mind living out in the middle of nowhere and you like living in a in your mundane land, of course. But since everyone wants to have the best and the brightest, they want to have their mithril. I mean, their titanium. They want to have their um, adamantine. I mean, tungsten. Um, they want to have gold <laughs> and <laughs> and silver. You have gold, gold, and. Your gems and your precious stones and and whatever whatever fantasyite that you have in your realm, and I, I like I have a place where yeah there's yeah there's basic yeah you know, there's basic adamantine there's basic um you know if you go out into the very deeps the heart so you know because you know tungsten does exist out there it it's rare but you can buy it. You can buy titanium. It's rare. It's in only a few locations, but you can buy it. Do you want something in vast quantities? You might have to go to the places where they exist, but there probably are things that are there that pro I have a horrible place that I refer to as um, Endgame Land. Uh, it's jokingly referred to as Endgame Land, but it has an actual name. But everyone knows that you go there, and that's where all the high-end materials that you can't find anywhere else are all found at. Do you want your multicolored jades? Do you want to have your I uh, your thoriums, your I uh, your thoriums, your your ceramite steels and all these weird weird um weird components? It's all found in this one area, but it's a very scary land full of monsters and terrible and terrible things cuz you know it's obviously the most powerful place where all the, most, where all the best materials, the best magic site is all hiding at. Yeah, you can find inferior coins around the rest of the world, no problem. But you want the best, the, the, the best of the best for your top end item? Of course, everybody does. So everybody's fighting for this little chunk of land. And then every once in a while, Godzilla comes up there and, you know, kicks, you, you know, kicks your colony into the ocean. And it's, and, and it's fun because I because I also refer to it as Kaiju Island, and they're like, and they're like, oh yeah, we're totally going to. Do you want to go fight the four-headed Jotun with eight with eight arms, who's the size of a mountain? Um, yes. Okay, cool. You fought him, but Ghidorah shows up next week, and then Godzilla's got his schedule thing. Cthulhu will make his appearance in about a month. This place is terrible and horrible. What? Why would anyone want to live here? Do you want? Do you want that ultra pure, um, pure, pure metal for your artifact sword and or bat and or battleship you're building? Yes, I kind of need it. Good. Go fight. I go go play. I go play. I go play tag with a. I with the horrible monsters that live here. This place is terrible. Why doesn't anyone want to leave this place? 
I, why does anyone want to go here? High end materials. Why does anyone? Why don't these monsters go and conquer the rest of the world? No, they know that. Like, why would she go out there and kick it, and kick over an ant hill three yards over? No, all the best death stuff over here because they want it too, and it's like this horrible little island. But it's funny because the entire world knows that. So you have high end adventurers who are paid to. I need you to go into this land of hell. Yep, and mine me ten kilograms of this stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Now pay me about a half a million go uh, gold pieces. Okay, I'll pay you that. And then they get to have high level adventures where they get uh, where they get go to you know dodge dodge giant fireballs, evil wizards, and floating doom land because everybody wants the end game stuff. And well, the rest of the world doesn't have it. And the rest of the world's okay with as long as all the bad guys are fighting over there, it's okay. We can all have our empires over here. And also, every every Jotun, I, every Jotun and Kaiju knows that they're only one monster. And when they go out there, Blaine knows. I Blaine knows way too much about um, how armies work. You're a really powerful thing, but Godzilla gets defeated by a bunch of Freon tanks and some destroyers. So don't. Uh, um, and so like I said. So every monster knows. Okay, I'm really powerful here, but I don't want to go and fight and you know fight the Roman Legion, because like I said, we all watch Godzilla's eye and minus one. We know Godzilla gets beaten by a bunch of tugboats. So <laughs> I mean, it's it's fun. It's terrible, and I love it because it's I. It's a great place to go. You want high end stuff? You want to go to high land? Uh, high end land? I'm going to colonize this. Congratulations football practice and it's a wonderful little place where i get to play high level games with players and they go like do you do you attract the attention of god oh, you mean actual god yeah it's just an actual god just walking around he just he hates you oh um why god wants to have good equipment too and he needs to get resources well can't god just snap his fingers this isn't that kind of deity but I no, you gotta follow the rules like everybody else does. Oh, okay, but no, I do actually have you know certain regions have certain resources, certain things specialize in certain res uh, in certain developments, and if you're in a jungle, you're probably not getting mass mass mithril mithril um deposits, but you're probably going to get awesome um you know reagents for your alchemy. So there's lots of trade, lots of things. People are constantly going. Where can I get good sugar at? Where can I get good spices and cinnamons at? Can I build a build a, a plantation so I can have good farming and good food? Because I would because I want a good donut, and I don't want to, and I don't want to. You know, they ask silly questions, and yes, knowing the resources is great because it allows you to do my my thing of we're all going to play Elite Dangerous in in D and D where or. Eve Online in D and D because, guess what, um, people want stuff, and stuff, and not everyone has all stuff in one spot. You need to haul stuff, but that doesn't sound like adventure. It doesn't sound like adventure to you. That's all. Okay. Yep. And yes, go back and start watching. Are slave labor. Okay. You're a bunch of retards who are given a simple task, and then we all cry because you can't figure out how to do that. I need to start going back and watching Kai's videos and maybe learn how to talk like Kai. Because admittedly, what I was trying to say was pretty much what Kai said, <laughs> but my words were not coming out of my mouth. I've had a lot of time to think about this shit. Just remember that. <laughs> He's had a lot of time, and he's actually built several worlds. So yeah, there. hey Nz, I have I have two worlds. I don't build. I have two very very well developed worlds. Thank you. So we've looked at you know the resources and everything else, and you know how does geography affect a culture's way of life? And with the creatures, I'm going to use the example of, you know, society in a coastal region relies heavily on fishing trade. So, you know, I'm going to start with Kai. How, you know, where, where they're located, 
how do you make sure to tie in the the natural things that they are are getting in order to export them etc okay the important thing is no matter where you drop your people at wherever you go drop your starting area that you're going to be working on are they like if you say you're looking at a coastal area or somebody who's living on, on a bunch of rivers you now have the idea in essence do they i it's easier to it's easier to sail do they have access to the ability of wood and timber and quantity if they have those two things you have the ability to have mass travel along boats along coastlines along up, up rivers as long as the river is vast wide and navigable you have the ability to stretch trade inland fast but if you because boats do travel far faster than a person can walk so you might see a merchant a, a merchant a, a merchant empire or a river-based empire being able to extend deep into into the land and into the continent or along coastlines but you might start seeing them have problems you know walking into the interior but if you see i but if you're more of a inland empire you might have to start asking well how far can a, a this geography comes back down to communications because i know we all depend on mat on match to do most of our you know heavy lifting or we just snap our fingers and say oh somebody just you know sends magic spell out no communications move at the speed of a person can walk so if you're in a heavily wooded so say person can walk on bare on planes 13 miles stand I, i'm gonna go with standard path, pathfinder kingmaker um tr travel distance one hex 13 miles so huffing i, I you know, you leading a bunch of donkeys, carrying all your shit on your back or whatever across unmodified terrain, miserable uh, and miserable uh, grassland conditions where you're just walking 13 miles. So how long do you need to be able to, like, how long is an acceptable delay for central communications for trade? On average, like, it, I throw a road down. Road now doubles your movement. I can now move 26 kilometers. 26 miles in a day not bad i have a horse i can now double that again i'm now looking at a 40 something kilometer radius that i can sorry a 40 mile radius that i can now govern efficient efficiently one day to reach the peri uh, the periphery of my uh, of my region i can now have so so one day and then one day back so whatever communications i lag i now have is a is a two-day communication can you can you effectively govern that way? Yes, one day I, one day delay in communications is not too bad. Two days not too bad. Now try to expand expand out to, but that's just on open plains. Now we're going to go look at suddenly we have forests. Forest have forest have your speed. So you're living in a heavily wooded region with roads. You're only looking at now moving. Tw you know. 20 miles in a day at best on horseback because well you don't know i things are I, things are dangerous things are di dicey you can't see far so you want to move slower move safer i want to move i i want to move through hilly terrain through I, through hilly terrain hills have speed again now it's i now i'm hilly and and on top of that it's um it's wooded because I'm under the tree line, oh, things start getting really not pleasant for purposes of moving. Communications start to start to slag, lag out. How long are you willing to wait? Well, I'm going to cross a mountain range. Mountains take a uh, mountains quarter things. So now we're looking at oh, it's a wooded mountain. Oh, it's going to take weeks to you know a week to cross that. What would be a simple you know 10, 15 mile pass unless you carve that pass out and make it a pack. You know that's why passes become immensely valuable choke points so important because that's an easy area for people to travel through you don't want to go over the mountains you know Sa I and saruman might throw birds at you um or cause a snowstorm you might end up dying from weather you know oh man we're taking a shortcut to the mountains every you have been snowed in and now you must eat your friends donner party um <laughs> It's like 
one of those things where you have to think about a lot of this, you know, dictates. And plus, oh no, you've encountered a river. It wasn't on the map, and there's no bridge. Now you must go do the the dreaded Oregon Trail thing. Do you ford the river? And suddenly your boat, and suddenly your wagon sinks. Because let's be honest, we all, um, we all literally, you know, have played Oregon Trail. We've all had our wagons sink on the first river. So, and, th- and th- think about how most adventurers play. How many of us are weighed down with, uh, with 40 to 80 to 100 pounds of gear? And how many of us took athletics to swim? Nobody. So how many of us die on the first river? Everybody. Because none of us took engineering. So none of us could like lash four logs together and float the fighter across because the fighter's too stupid and the barbarian can't swim. But don't worry, we got that one retard. I mean, uh, spell cast. goes, I could cast water walk. Oh, good. You get across. The rest of us are all wondering how we how we don't drown crossing, you know, hip deep over. So you get to watch the fighter with his sword over his head going, this is... This is not pleasant. I do not. I I have water in my socks. I'm gonna be miserable for the next day, and it's t- and like a lot of these are things that we don't really think about because we're used to playing, um, t- you know, Tolkien walking simulator where the idea of of course you're gonna be out there for four to five weeks wandering through there while somebody plays triumphant music in the background as you cross a ridge that looks beautiful for that one shot, but. Civilization isn't adventurers, and you're building a world that's supposed to be living. People kind of want to be able to, you know, not sleep in a desolate field out in the middle of nowhere. They're going to build small little towns. And so it, I know we live in a modern age where we have highways, the ability to drive 80 miles per hour everywhere on the interstate. But there's a reason why every why when you travel everywhere, I, I'm sorry, I live in the Midwest, so therefore... I'm used to driving extremely long distances to get anywhere. But you ever notice something? Every 10 miles, there's a town. Every 10 miles, there's a town. Because that is about how far people were willing to travel by foot before we had cars. And that's why when I'm leaving Peoria, I drive 10 miles, there's a town. It's Metamora. It sits there. And then I drive 10 more miles. It's Roanoke. I'm there. I drive 10 more I, I, 10 miles in their direction. I'm in Eureka. Every town's about 10 to 12 miles per hour, a, a, apart. This should give you an idea that every town is a, like you're going to find a community that has a gas station, general store, restaurant, a restaurant, diner, and a place to sleep for travelers. Yes. And a simple market in every one of these little towns. They're not grand, they're not wonderful. They, you know you're going to have merchants traveling through it, but the terrain always dictates this. You're not going to see, you know, like if you can't walk more than 10 miles in a day into the mountains, well, no one's going to build a lot of things except for the dwarves. Dwarves like mountains. Well, now you got a reason why the mountain, why dwarves elves don't get penalties while walking through woods. Well, of course, their communities are spread apart in the woods. Woods are a na- and dense forests are a natural place for them because the humans go. We can't really go there. Dwar- I play Dwarf Fortress, and you'll be sitting here going, "Oh no, I don't. Ah, this sucks." And you just play Dwarf Fortress for a while, or you sit, you figure it out like, and then you start figuring out, okay, cultural niches, or if you have people who go, "No, we live on mostly just fungus and other things." Well, now you got a cultural niche for those people to to live in. I mean, you got to be able to figure out. I, for, uh, terrain matters a lot because this is how your trade networks connect. And rivers are magic. M- rivers just give you wonderful amounts. And then, and then the, the first moment a player goes, can I make my boat go faster? Well, yes. Of course you get your boat go faster. And now you're doing double the speed? Well, now you've got vast roads that are... So, so suddenly you don't need to have a town. You don't need to have a... Germantown Hills, Metamora, I row a note before you get to Pontiac, you get to have, oh, well, I have my trade town of of Portsburg, and then I travel what would be a four-day trip by barge, and now I'm in, you know, Rivertown. And Rivertown gets to go, oh, yeah, we're the major trading part. I we're, we're now the major trading hub with Port Town. So 
And so now you get to see, okay, so now everybody who's got wagons will now gravitate towards towards I Riverton. So you get these little like cluster hubs that now is like, well, okay. So as long as it's like, so Riverton matters because it's now the major trade hub that gets you down the river to something big, big one, you know, one day, two days down travel down river. It's, or from there, you got to figure out, how, do, I mean, do your boats handle deep water very well? Has anyone figured out how to, you know, build a boat that can go into the deep blue sea? If the answer is no, everyone's going to hug your coastlines. And so therefore the, the coastlines are going to be mapped, but the ocean will have big, big, big fluffy dragons in it and it says, here be dragons, because when you travel out into the deep water, you die. And so therefore, therefore a bunch of raggedy men wearing be I, with beards in, in in giant rowboats come out of the ocean and we're like we are not sea people we are we are um not vikings and we are here because you have pretty things give us your stuff uh, and you're like but wait no that's not how this works and then suddenly you have a a castle on fire and, and a church on fire and a bunch of um weird smelly dudes in with beards rowing back out into the ocean you're like People don't go out to the ocean. Ocean is scary. Where do they come from? They are sea bandits. I shall mark them down as sea people. And now we have the collapse of the Bronze Age. Yay. Sorry about that. I talked too much there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Bother me any? Baron seems to be gone. But no. A big chunk of this is: Do you play civilization? Where where do you get the best resources from? <laughs> Those are where you want to live. You figure out. Like I said, it, it's all about trade. It, it's all about movement. It's all about how you walk, how you travel, and everything uh, hinges around that. And the faster you travel, the the less you need to have the intermediates. So yeah. But since we play mostly fantasy, it. But then again, if you, but then again, if you're playing with say Traveler, once again, what's the average jump speed? I j jump rating. Okay, those are the important worlds. Smaller, you know, smaller jump one hubs don't, aren't aren't needed because you have jump two. If jump three is the common one, you you don't need to have the intermediates anymore, unless they're just emergency refill stops. You can start bypassing things. It's the whole reason why jump four, jump five is is so insane because well now you're jumping multiple fucking fucking hexes at once airships same thing how a craft a crafting how fast yeah. is your airships uh and i have at this particular moment in time i am abstract with their worldly speed but i have made engines that are faster to one another okay how fast approximate okay I know you're abstract. How fast does a boat? How fast does a boat travel? Are we talking about sailing ship speeds? No, the planet is the size of Jupiter. We're literally talking um, outer space speeds, just to get anywhere. Okay, that's why it's abstract. Okay. Okay. How? F so we're talking about. Okay, we got some weird. Uh, okay, we're gonna have some fun things, some fun issues that are gonna come up because the way you drew your ships are are, are open top, um, like almost sailing vessels, in their yeah. design. Okay, I don't know about you, but I do not want to be standing on on deck or even with an open porthole, I, I, I porthole or a hatch or a gunnery or a gunnery bay. When I'm traveling at several hundred kilometers per second, or or hour, or even hour, like once you get about like like you want to be enclosed. At, I, once you start start reaching, you know, um, accelerations that are usually meant for spacecraft, or we're playing traveler, and I'm you know burning at several G's of acceleration continuously to be able to make transit across the planet you're going to run into people aren't standing on deck not with there's air pressure you're going to get you're going to see people being blown off the ship very quickly do some yeah, yeah. or the sudden stop. The abstract nature of it right but the thing here is is that you're right it get 
All right, Baron just said the most important thing. It's the sudden stop or turning. Yeah. That's going to cause problems. Mostly, I'm have I'm happily here, and then the captain goes, "We're making an emergency turn to port," and then inertia says, "I keep going forward." <laughs> the boat goes one way, I go the other. I hope the I hope the guardrail cuts me in half, um, <laughs> because I will be dead instead of falling into the bottom of the universe. Now, so. I know the idea that the planet is the size of Jupiter is a cool idea. I like this, but travel, travel is going to be an important thing unless I don't know, unless there's a magical thing that e that eliminates inertia <laughs> or momentum. Now, if that is a development that allows, you know, ships to move at exceedingly high speeds and everybody gets to walk around on deck, like they're all happy you know, happy until they leave the um, the the anti the anti momentum bubble. Cool, that's a cool thing. But like I said, once we start looking at inter uh, interplanetary space probe or uh, orbital velocities, things start to look very. Um, I'm going to die now. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and the ships I don't think are going to have like a Heisenberg compensator on them to be able to to take care of the inertia like i said if that's one of the things that makes the drop the airship drive work is that it also extends a a you know die bubble i momentum won't kill you bubble that's cool that's it because again i play like traveler has where does grav plates come from no one knows no one explain understands it it's just it's just high technology grav plates exist and we all go okay grav plates exist Okay, cool. We don't have to deal with um, thrust-based, I uh, thrust-based gravity, so we're not having to build our build our ships like um, sh ships like uh, oh god, um, like like skyscrapers, where you're where the main the main fusion drive is at the back and pushing you, and you all build each floor up from the engine uh, the engine room. If you don't want to have that, just create something that eliminates the. The we go splat if we accelerate too fast. Um, button, I, I in buttons or and have it have some flaws, have some you know, it isn't a 100% cancellation, so you do get to feel when the ship lurches a bit to the right or begins to, to drift a little bit. But you know, we only feel like you know a little bit of um force, but you know, we're not having the sense of. We could be plastered against the uh, against you know the starboard side of the hull because the ship turned too hard. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Like I said, but speed is important. I, I know you're asking it, and that's cool. But speed is important because you need to have an idea of how far a ship can travel in a day. Because if you just say it can travel, you run into I'm going to call it seven seas problem. The seven seas issue because that game also has has a rule that says in combat you can move wherever you want so we had a situation where somebody goes by rules we can do this all right we leave port now i look to my friend and i challenge him to a duel do you accept yes combat has been engaged the ship now teleports across <laughs> the ocean to somewhere somewhere else for the guy who's also the duel is also the captain of the ship, and he is steering the boat to the other side of the to the other side of the ocean. We have now teleported the ship because we got into a duel. By movement rules and by combat rules, that is legitimately one thing we can do. And please don't have that happen. Now, any GM who's sane will say, no, that's not how that's not how ships work. But then you go, that is how that is how combat works. For I have engaged myself in a duel. I have run across the entire length of the castle. What? By movement rate, I can do that. And the enemy can also chase me across the entire length of the castle. But I am now on the other side of the castle. Nobody else who's engaged in combat can walk after me. Because I am super fast. Because combat is dumb. Seven <laughs> Seas is beautiful. First edition was a, was a wonderful trade wreck. Because that rule is the dumbest rule ever written. Please don't have a rule similar to that. 
please have at least a number that all ships move in equivalency to. I don't care if it's just if airship speed units. It doesn't have to be kilometers per hour. It doesn't have to be miles per hour. Just have it be airship speed units. We'll just call it AS, you know, ASUs. The ship moves three ASUs. Fantastic. I now know how, and it has a turn mode of two, so it has to, be, to move two airship units before it can make another, uh, another turn. Okay, and now it makes two, turn, another two. Or, because, I'm sorry, I'm a Starfleet Battles player, turn modes make sense to me. But have something that prevents you from being able to spin around in place in 360, you know, 360 no-scoping your battleship while, you know, moving... While you're doing 360s in the air, you're also, you know, getting you 360 degree coverage because you're spinning around and you're also rot so you're spinning around the X axis and you're also rotating around the Y axis and you're spinning because you can. Because why? Because shit, whatever. And you can now do this thing and you're teleporting across the battlefield. No, you need to stop this because somebody is going to try. The people, the person who used to do this is no longer with us but he will have tried because you have given him the option and he will and he would have destroyed your rule your movement rule engine i know because i might also have tried in the past to do to, to abuse your rule engine because the moment you give me the helm of a boat i'm going to beat the shit out of it i'm going to beat i'm going to figure out i am the worst person to give a new boat to because i'm going to Oh hey, I need you to do sea trials. How how close to rolling the boat over can I get? Yes, and that's what I'm going to do to your airship. If you make me captain, do not make me captain or helmsman of an airship. I will try to do a barrel roll like I'm playing Star Fox. <laughs> Which is actually an, an, an aileron roll. Thank you very much. But... <laughs> do a barrel roll. Do a barrel roll. Aileron roll. Barrel roll. <laughs> All right, uh, I, I I think we kind of went off the rails a little bit there, but that's okay. I think that was needed <clears throat> because I mean, in in his game, some of the things that are delineated that are are basically set down is the speed of ships and how fast they can get from point A to point B. That is a very big thing of uh, being able to disseminate the goods. So, yeah. I mean, for 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 his game, that would be definitely something to look at. I mean, you could even have it to where the reason that it costs a million dollars is because they you can use whatever wood you want to build a hull, but the uh, what is it the the that center. The center uh, beam that goes through the ship. Keel. Yes, the keel has to be made from this certain uh, wood. And there's only X amount of trees in the city. And it takes X amount of time to grow them. So you could actually use that, and that's what keeps everything from everybody from if you yeah, accidentally, you know, because thinking back, we could do, we you said we could ram things. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You have to have a ram from, but yes. Okay. But if 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 it's an open ship and there's no Please don't throw me, you know, at, you know, X thousand kilometers a second when I ram things, then yeah, we need, we need the, 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 the Heisenberg compensator. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't considered that. So what you can do is that either part of the keel, like the front part, because the ships used to be able to, you know, the because you have the the keel that runs the the full length, but then you have the the top that comes up and out. That's what actually does the protection, because typically ships are always going to go forward. 
Yeah. So that's the that that'll be the limitation in your game is that ships are not allowed to go backwards and they just won't move backwards. They have to go forwards and turn. Yeah, I have considered that. So I mean that see, see, this is good. We're brainstorming, we're 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 lear we're learning. While we're we're also teaching, which is amazing. I love it. I love everything about it. Twice on Thursday. Oh wait, is this Thursday? <laughs> yep. Uh, so and, and lastly, let's look at the actual wildlife because I don't think we've really talked about the wildlife. So how how does and I'm going to start with uh, TCG here. How does wildlife the region that you put them in or is, is there just every once in a while just something weird that happens and it uh, you know something sprouts three heads and goes crazy oh uh, it it goes all kinds of ways with me like I have more than once based uh, what a region will look like off of the animals you'll find in it. Like, if you'll find uh, you'll find a heavily predatorized area, you'll find a place that has a lot of very timid prey creatures and generally a lot of shrubbery because the prey creatures aren't there for very long, so they aren't eating it. A shrubbery? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and if you've find a lot of uh, prey creatures in the area but not a lot of predators you're going to find a lot of area just completely decimated in the way of plant life because well there's a, there's nothing stopping the, pre the prey from eating everything and there's also uh, uh, especially in palladium there are a lot of digger uh, excuse me a second all right Kai what about you I'm how, how, how oh, oh I was going to do one little thing Oh, uh, go ahead. I thought you had to. I thought you had somebody at your door. So, I did, but I wanted to finish with one little thing. Uh, there are plenty of creatures in Palladium that dig, and I have actually had entire mountain ranges, not just by dwarves, but by these digger creatures, altered. Like not necessarily build up the mountain, but if you go across the mountain, you'll find an area, entire areas that have been landscaped, not necessarily for the good of the mountain, but it's just completely different from what it was last year, because the diggers have moved dirt and piled it up somewhere. Okay. Now, All right, Ty. What about you? Uh, how do the 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 wildlife, uh, you know, with with the way that you your game the or games that you have set up, how are they affected by the regions? Okay, I know I mostly focus on the wet on the wet, warm, fresh and water inland sea, but yes, I. The, I, like it really does come down to you're not going to find a, a whole lot of creatures unless there's a, unless there's an actual food chain to support it. So you, I'm not I'm sorry I'm not going to throw a you know lions and tigers and you know okay the bears will be up in the cold water area but you're not going to see them you know too many of them down in certain areas. So it's just one of those I do pay attention to the climate. I also realize that I'm not going to throw too much unless it's unless there's a lot of invader species running around because well technically we're in a fantasy world where teleportation magic is and nobody gives a fuck about about the environment so um things are going to be weird but there's i'm i'm going to have wildlife based on what you know what region you're in so you're not going to i and what continent you're on what region there's certain uh, certain sea monsters that will only be native to certain areas. Certain, is it a freshwater sea monster? Is it a, is it a I, is it a saltwater sea monster? Is it brackish? Does it live in this area? Is it is it a jungle? Is it a a temperate region? Is it a pole a, a subarctic or arctic region? I uh, area is it, it, you're going to encounter mount, you know, creatures that only live in the mountains. But they'll be, and I'll try to divide them up by which continent you're going to be on. Though I do have the idea that if they're intelligent, there's a good chance that they, if it's an intelligent monster, it's that is 
can do any kind of crafting at some point in the past. It probably has migrated and explored and gone everywhere else. But I also know that certain players or certain people in the past go, I really like a tiger population to be transported. And they'll move an entire tiger trip population from one continent to the next. And, you know, that might have happened thousands of years ago. So we have some divergency. And I'll throw, you know, basic, uh, you know, basic ideas like, oh, hey, this tiger grew up in a in a weird fairy forest that, you know, has a lot of bioluminescence. So therefore, it's it's coloration and and coat might you know might reflect the fact that it lives in a weird glowing um, a fairy forest that has that casts weird shadows. So its coloration will be extremely bizarre. So you know when you capture it's like, hey, this tiger's you know, kind of looks like a displacer beast in coloration, but it's got weird blue stripes. Why would it have those? Because it came from that kind of forest. Oh, so there's more creatures like in that one? Yeah, there's a good chance that if you go out into the into the dark evil fairy forest that you could probably find some weird monsters that are different. I want to go. Why? I want I want a glowing I want a glowing tiger, please. That I can ride into combat and or and or put put, put its head on my wall. All right, and now we get to go. And now I get to go have the adventures of um, some eighteen you know eighteen hundreds British adventurer wandering off into the wood into the woods with a pith helmet on because he wants to go hunt it. I, I hunt a magical tiger that's out in the woods that does weird things, and I get to go. Yeah, it exists out there, and watch the druid go. I'm going to kill him. What I'm just gonna kill, I, I'm going to kill that guy, and no, I'm just going to murder him in the street at night. Just just going to do it. Why? Because he wants to go murder the weird, the, the weird ultra rare blue glowing tiger. I don't want that half. You know, it's like, and it's fun because now I have plot hooks to go. Hey druid, hey druid, yeah, you want to kill this guy? I want to kill him, kill him. All right, and now suddenly there's a big firefight between between the party, the the party back at the druid. And this weird, um, this weird hunter and his hunting and his hunting party of 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 assholes. And now you and now suddenly you know one player gets hit with a you know an an arbalist that's you know as powerful as an elephant gun that pins him to a tree. I can have fun adventures now because why? Because I made a uh, I made a cool dr- a, a cool tiger that lives in a special wood, or I get to have players who are very terrified of going into water because. It, because a crocodile, because the water is warm, the water is clear, the water is nice, and there's f- plenty of food, so the so the crocodile is huge. So they're like, oh hey, is that a plesiosaur? That is a plesiosaur. I don't want to be here anymore. Why? It's a plesiosaur. I'm going somewhere else. Aw, but you don't want to go fight the Loch Ness monster. Not when the Loch Ness monster has the ability to move faster than me in in an ocean I can't see the shore on. I'm going to die now, aren't I? Yes. Okay. We're taking our little canoe and we're and we're going to make it go really, really fast. Why? Because I don't want to get eaten by the um, by dinosaurs. Aww. Water scary. Water scary. Okay. And that that kind of fun and weirdness. I. It's terrain so much more fun. If you haven't told, I uh, haven't figured out. I put a lot of a, a lot of thought into my little inland sea jungle land of weird monsters because that's been. I'm the area I've been having fun playing in for, for, for a couple of years now. So, all right. So, I really don't have anything else left uh, except for, uh, you know, we, we've looked at the construction, the, the stuff that's thrown into it. Now, and I'm going to start with Kai on this one. How does geography affect the gameplay and player experience? Once you've got everything laid out, how does it affect how you go about, you know, disseminating the information, bringing them into the immersion of the world, you know, etc. Honestly, once you've done all the hard work figured out all the, you know, I know we've been throwing out a lot of details, a lot of ideas, a lot of work. The thing is, is that all of this does one thing. It creates a consistent, cohesive story and an image 
that you can portray. If you can, if you could describe the Amazon River Delta in a very interesting fashion, if you can describe going out onto Lake Michigan in a way that feels right, where you know that point where you go out in the boat and you no longer can see shore and all you can see is waves and sky and that's it. Can you describe that and make it feel right? Can you like knowing I knowing all this information? If you can do all the homework your players shouldn't realize just how much work has gone into it because they're just going to simply go travel into town and they're going to see a market that's going to be functioning. They're going to see barges on the harbor that are do, that are un, that are unloading and loading freight and cargo. They're going to like so when they cuz the one thing you don't want to do as a GM is to have a town that is lifeless where you've arrived and nobody is doing anything and everyone's just standing around waiting for you to walk up to a guy with a question mark over their head or an exclamation mark over their head you do not need to have a glowing pillar of light that says this is the quest giver this is the guy you need to go talk to to have to have information your party should arrive into town the gate guards should sound like they're used to travelers so if you're in a, you know, if you thought about the culture, like if this is an isolated community that, that never sees anybody, and you walk in and they all look, give you that look, that weird pod people look, because you figured out that this is a town that doesn't see people. You're the outsider. Congratulations, everyone's looking at you and go, hey! they point at you and scream because you're different. You're not around there. But if you're in a trade town that you figure out. This is a hub community that has trade, that has this, has that. You're just another face in the crowd. If but because you figured out, because you've done the homework, you know what the food is. The, the food is like. It isn't just simply congratulations. You're in generic, I generic, not I not Anglo-Saxon English town where we have only pig and porridge. Like we have pork product and nothing else because you put some thought into it well now you know okay there's there's fishing there's cattle ranching like well because of the fact that there's vast plains we can do cattle ranching oh we don't have that we have pigs so there's pig and pork we're in a hilly region okay so it's got sheep or a sheep like product oh we don't have sheep well someone has to make clothes what are the clothes made out of is it flax is it i is it some kind of cotton well, you you got an idea what what, what that's like. Well, it, that isn't made here. Where's it made at? Now, now you know that there's a trade. There's gonna be a trade town. So when a player goes, hey, I'm looking for things to purchase. Hey, or you can go down to the dockyards and there's people who are actually working. Why? Because you know that there's four communities that are all, you know, hauling in freight by barge into this town. Or you know that there's caravans that come in every three or four days that bring fresh food, that bring fresh cloth, that bring uh, linens and cottons in. You know that this is what I'm, uh, what's going on here. So you know that, oh, hey, look, the, the orcs, who I, your orcs or generic bad guy stand-ins are, are blocking the road. Well, you know that, okay, there, there's probably a caravan that's stuck three days out. Or, hey, we haven't seen a caravan in two days. Well, you know there's a, that, that, that caravan might have had a problem anywhere along this road that has a three-day a three -day travel path, I, I travel delay. You, it, you can cast the adventure in a better light. You've done the homework. You know the jump routes. You know the travel routes. You know it all. But now you can give, the, give a more intelligent, uh, I, a bit of a material. If you can lay a map out and go, Hey, this is where I think the problems are. And you can draw a line on the map. You know, put your finger and trace a line. Your player gets to go, oh, okay, I'm I'm following what you're saying because now you you don't have to say it is approximate. It is due. It is due north by, and you need to travel north for three days, or or twenty two miles. And you'll arrive at the point where this is happening. That's great if we have GPS. That's great if we have orbital maps. But we don't have that. We have some some farmer who goes, yeah, it's about three days out. Just like 
when you see the old burned down barn where the old town used to be, yeah, that's where you need to pick. I, I where they're probably hiding out at, and you can make it all sound better. But because if you you put the sweat in ahead of time, you can you can just relax and put more flavor in character and give the personality you want to give. I uh, congratulations you, the town that. When you arrived, you had nothing more on Adventure One because remember, players only get the, you only get to play for for two to four hours a week or a session, and the play you don't you might just have written down a glorious is a town on a hill on the side of a river, and that's all you started with. But guess what? You've got five days. You got six days to to start mapping out what the party has oh hey look there's a ruined castle nearby okay that's another adventure you have time now to start flashing it out the and you start radiating out the information you don't you start with a, a blank slate you're tabula rasa on adventure one by adventure 10 you should have you should have an idea that the party travels about x number of miles a day and now you can but this is why you got to be careful when you give your players infinite mobility and flight is infinite mobility because when you're playing with terrain you have natural blockers you can only walk so far in a day how far does boat how far does a boat sail very very far even even a slow six miles an hour 24 hours later you've you've given a the circle of probability of where you could end up gets quite large and flight takes that even farther fast flight the faster you fly the the more insane the circle becomes like oh he only travels at 100 miles per hour how long can it fly fly before it has to land and cool off the engines or refuel oh it can travel about five hours at 100 miles per hour congratulations gm you've now given yourself a 500 mile circle that you need to know do you know it? No. Is it fly? Is most of it flyover country? Probably, but your party can choose to land anywhere. And now you got to figure out how does anyone do anything when you can try. This is why I'm giving you the warning of figure out your flight speed. You have the benefit though in your crafting in your world where you have islands. But how does how do people know where the islands are? I, are there small places and outcrops to disappear into and land on? These are all things you got to worry about when you start having speeds that are insane because the circle of probability to hunt for somebody becomes impossible to catch. It's when I play Battletech, one of the things I had to worry about is how do you intercept somebody who's coming in from half a solar system away and no matter where you go they can go somewhere else the problem here is is that i have sensors i can track their engine plumes i can divert and there's fuel costs but if you don't have fuel you don't and, and your only worry about is food but there's food can be bypassed it's in, in ways so unless you have fuel the only thing you got to worry about now is time and speed and because in essence because you're, you're using what is what amounts to magical nuclear reactors, your your lifespan is beyond the range of a tactical environment, and when you have the ability to travel a thousand kilometers per hour anywhere in a circle, in five in five hours you'll never in an hour you never, if I can break contact, you'll never find me, and that is a and that is a problem and a benefit. Your players will see it as a boon unless they have to go track down somebody. But this becomes the problem of everything in the world now focuses on the small pieces that actually matter, where your cities are, where your trade hubs are, where your resources are gathered. Because anyone can travel anywhere else, but they have to come to port. And the port becomes the most valuable thing in the world. And now, and now you know where the Navy's at. When the Navy... When the fleet is has to guard something, they know it's at port. Because once you go to sea, you're never going to force an engagement. Once you go into the, the airship realm, you're, you never, you'll never be able to catch anyone. 
and you, and unless you have magical detection that's insanely long range, you're never going to see it coming. And there's clouds everywhere that can that can conceal movement, and you only had to mark one eyeball. You're going to have people <laughs> dive into a, into a cloud bet into a cloud bank, and then die. You know, unless you got eagle eyes at all at all out at, at all ranges, that little and trust me, big ships become very small very quickly at a distance. So the guy. So even if you have a super carrier sized airship, it's going to turn into a deceptively small dot darting through clouds that are catastrophically much bigger than it. And and, and they're moving at bullet speeds. Try it. You're watching You're watching a thousand foot long bullet moving <laughs> through cloud. <laughs> Nobody's going to see it coming until literally it arrives like the star destroyer at the at the end of rogue one you're all having fun and then suddenly the um the imperial battleship arrives thump oh shit and then you hit it and then you bounce off of its hull and die horribly because you're in a corvette and the, and the star destroyer lo looks at you funny and then blows up your friend and they and that's the kind of that's the kind of crazy you're going to be looking at if you don't find a way to give give anyone any sense of detection, but this is where movement comes so important, and why you why flight is scary, flight is terrifying. It is every player wants it. No GM should ever desire anyone to ever fly. I love airships. Trust me, I love airships, but flight changes everything no no castle uh, there's no fortifications there's no walls there's no choke points you can go anywhere and as and the faster you can move this is why everyone's like oh airships move at like 10 kilometers per hour 20 kilometers per hour but we're all used to the idea of modern air flight where you can where things move at 700 miles per hour and that's a slow airliner well, that's not a slow airliner. That's a pretty fast airliner. But it's a good airliner that's moving at 700 kilometers per uh, 700 miles per hour. And he's like, I'm flying. Yeah, at, at nearly the speed of sound. And that's not going that fast. And that's something realizing that in three hours, you've, I, you're now looking at a, a 21, a 2,100 mile radius that you've traveled. Good luck trying to detect it unless you have a massive air a massive ground air radar system that's sitting here to track everyone's movements in real time and communicate that. But communications are slow unless you have a way of getting communications to go up faster. So unless, so it all, it, just save yourself a lot of heartache. Don't let anyone fly for more than 10 seconds or 10 minutes and keep it slow because otherwise the entire world begins to collapse or you're, or the amount of work that you need to do becomes immense and the world becomes very small all of a sudden. It's a very big world. It's a very small plant. And yeah, sorry to just ramble there, but I'm just letting you go. It's, okay. it's one of those times where we just shook you up and went, here you go. And Trust you just me. sit back and go. I put a oh, lot so of thought into flight and the kind of, and the um, the consequences of flight. Oh yeah, I, I I had not realized that myself, and I'm sitting here going, uh, what? Yeah. All right. It's, it so. is definitely something to consider because I. Like Barrett said, I had to consider that when I needed a flying game. The thing, the only reason why I've thought about it is because of the fact that I usually play smugglers. I will tell you the truth. I play smugglers and traders and and black market and black market um, marketeers. So for me, the ability to lose. Also, when I play ground combat, I ground I ground transport characters. I try to envision the idea of doing the cannonball run. <laughs> 
or Smokey the Bandit. What are the most important things? Is like we when you watch Smokey the Bandit or Cannonball Run, or you think about being a, a, a smuggler. How do you do it? How do you? Like, the thing about Smokey the Bandit is, is that Smokey did I, the Bandit didn't want. Like, he didn't want to break contact with the police. He's trying to lead them away constantly. But that's that. But Cannonball Run was, I want to break contact. I don't want to get caught. I want to get across the country as fast as humanly possible. But if you're playing a smuggler, your entire thing is, is how do you get in and, in and out of a location without being detected? How fast can you move? Out being seen when you all when you think about I'm playing like sub like like, like driving a submarine it, it comes down to how do you like how fast can you move without someone finding you it's noise it's, it's a lot of things every single environment every single vehicle that you choose every single way that you maneuver is it leaves a way that you have to think about how it functions most of us don't think about it because most of us just play a big, loud, noisy group of individuals who who thump around in the you know in the muck in the mud and being in essence a bunch of goddamn uh, just peasant, uh, people just wandering through the countryside, you know, listening to, to to Lord of the Rings music playing in the background because that's how it oh because that's how we think it works until you realize that no, no. Um, Middle Earth is uh, I, Middle Earth is fucked because it's the end because it's a dying it, it's a dying civilization living in the debris of, uh, in the debris of a of a more glorious time. Roads aren't maintained; it's all trash. But unless you plan on playing in a debris-strewn wreckage, a wreckage uh, an empire where you know it's post-apocalyptic. Yes, Lord of the Rings. I, I Lord of the Rings. I actually count as post. -apocalyptic post-apocalyptic because there was a grander civilization that has collapsed and you're in the ashes of it and you're wandering around the like ancient roads that aren't maintained ancient fortresses that aren't maintained it's that you're in a decayed fallen empire where you could see what was once glorious but you don't have it and everything is about travel time everything like ultimately everything's about travel time and communications and the more you start worrying about terrain, the more you gotta think about how all of that works and why, again, flight bypasses all of it. Because after all, what do, what is the one thing we always that everyone has made made a comment of since they've read Lord of the Rings? Why didn't the eagles drop off the ring? Because the eagles could have just flown to Mount Doom and dropped it off. And I'm sure there would have been enough eagles that they could have run interception for the. I, for the, you know, few dragons that were, you know, like, oh, no. Okay. Eagle one, you are the ring bearer. Eagles two through 48 are interceptors. Your job is to intercept and run blockade for the for the 12 dragons that we know are in the area, the, the 12 drakes that are, you know are in the area. Each of you is tasked to, to, to three of you are tasked to tackle each of those freaking drakes. You are the only one who matters. The rest of us could die. You matter. Go, heavenly bird. Bird one, go. And then once you watch the rest of the eagles play interception. And no, no, that, no, no, the guy, the, the head eagle that's at the back of the location, you don't know how, but he has a mace and he goes, dive. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, like, because everyone has said, why, like, why didn't the Eagles deliver the freaking uh, the freaking ring? Because it would have been easy. And the, and the moment you give mass flight, continuous mass flight to players, you have now presented the Eagle problem to all of your players. Why don't we just fly in? Why walk? Why take three weeks to walk there? Our enti the entire invading army will take one week to arrive there by foot. Or we have one guy fly for two hours, drop off, you know, drop, you know, sits there with the teleport beacon, drops the drops the stick that has the little glowing crystal on it. That, that the mage goes, I know the signal has been been transmitted. I now know, bloop bloop, for 
I had three mages teleport an elite strike team into the middle of the enemy castle. Boom. The adventurers now fan out and begin murdering the castle, which has no idea that you were there. Uh, one guy uh, gives a choked out, you know, distress signal because the fighter is dumb, slow, and failed his roll. And now the guards begin, begin to have their wake up mobilization point where people are like, oh, I, I need to put armor on for the next five minutes. And meanwhile, you have. Uh, you have the insane, uh, uh, the insane death quick gu- uh, guards who are running around slicing throats and gutting people while they're all getting prepared and flat footed. They you know, just run through, they're just murdering. It's like the freaking scene from, of, a, of a ninjas in Shogun. I uh, run into the castle and just start killing off samurai left and right because one, because two mages, I, uh, two mages teleported in following a druid who is carrying a stick. Flight is terrifying. Never allow it. Unless you're prepared, unless you are really prepared, and at that point you have like at that point every single castle becomes some kind of horrifying German flat nest where you have elite troops who are sitting here watching, you know, with with eagle eyes into the darkness, with heat vision, going out there and watching everything. And sir, I see a rogue eagle currently approaching us. Is it is the eagle? He's hunting for food. No, he is on a direct course to the castle. Sound the alarm. Whee! And you hear the alarm, the, the air raid sirens go up, and suddenly they're like they're loading proximity fuse, um, I right, proximity fuse, um, alchemist fired right, ballista bolts into there and firing them with light detection detonators. They, 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 they get into within five feet, they detonate, and then and I watch explosions fill the sky because everyone's afraid of well, that druid who could teleport into a birdie. Is probably carrying a staff that can transform with him, and the moment he get, uh, he lands in there, we'll have an elite strike team of a, of, of, a, of death of death of death commando assassins who are going to teleport into the into our town. We must not allow this to happen. Shoot down anything hostile. But it's just a it's just a falcon, sir. Kill it. It's a parakeet. Kill it. Start like just. And you watch like you know, the 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 flat I, I, the flat guns just like start, like Bofor guns are being loaded up with ballista bolts. Thump 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 thump. And you're just watching guys dropping dropping heavy ballista bolts into the fucking thing as they're just thump 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 thump. You're just watching it just and you're like, why are they so paranoid? Adventurers, adventures are why everyone is so. Pa- I, I why this thing looks like it like you're approaching a goddamn Iowa class battleship, just. The sky is exploding with explosions everywhere, and that and the druid dies, and you're like, <laughs> you should have walked. Or I have an airship. It's it's the it's the HMS Victoria, but it, I, I'm sorry. It's you know it's the Victory, but it's an airship. It's a it's a 98 gun. Uh, I gun. To, uh, I chip the line first class. Well, how the fuck do you fight that? Well, your castle better be able to fire back with as much firepower as that castle as that airship has got. Because remember, no matter how many guns you can bring to bear, you cannot beat. I you cannot beat. Um, your airship will never beat a fortress. It's designed to fight it. And if airships have been around now, if your airship has been around for a grand total of two point five seconds, you're the first one who has one. Nobody will have. I nobody will have a way to counter it. But if everybody has, but if they've been around and they're an integral part of culture. Defenses are going to be built around it. Nobody's like we only look upon the uh, upon a two D battlefield because we're all humans and we're stupid. No, we've had airships for two for two to three hundred years, if not longer. All of our guns are designed to tr- to train up because sky because sky birds are scary. Metal sky bird is scary. Must kill. And. The more advanced the airship is, the more the more advanced the defenses to stop it are, and they're not going to be simple a cannon on a mount that's looking upwards. No, it's going to be some horrifying. It's going to be a ballista. It's going to be that's going to be rapid firing because you have your airships that move at the speed of light. Because sorry, the speed of fast. So you're going to, need to have guns that track that fast. And they're going to fire that quick to anticipate the range, to be able to enter, to, to be able to put shots on target that quick, to be able to stop a, the airship from arriving because you don't want to have the last Jedi moment of 
It's a beautiful scene, but the players go, I will defeat the, en the enemy by sacrificing the flagship in a high-speed transit drives ramming attack into the castle, you know, into the throne room where I know the villain is. Boom, 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 boom. Three islands explode, you know, behind it because you impacted it that hard. Because the, the kinetic energy that's going to be in behind a several hundred ton air, uh, airship traveling at two to three hundred meters per second is going to be high and so when you start saying orbital velocity impacts and you're starting to see things that weigh a thousand tons hitting at that velocity you're going to see beautiful beautiful effects that will make ryan johnson bleed just ah uh, it's the best scene that makes no fucking sense and it shouldn't happen so Find a way to slow things down so that way you don't have have thousand ton kamikazes. Please. Well, I think that pretty much rounds us out for the, <laughs> the last twenty minutes has been Kai and I I'm I'm just kind of I I, I we're good. I'm sorry. I find it inspiring, so I find it. Well, yeah, I'm I'm good with it. I I'm great with it because that was 20 minutes. I'm actually here trying to get stuff set up for next week's stream already. So, uh, uh, make sure uh, you check us out next week. We are going to be here with uh, Bear, the Gen X GM, our good friend GM Cody. And we are going to, last week, you saw us uh, cre create heroic things to play. And next week, we are going to be heroic. So definitely make sure you check out his backer kit. I'll go ahead and... Throw that into the uh, into the chat for folks. Uh, it is uh, one hundred percent funded. They uh, were looking for fifteen hundred Canadian. They got twenty. They've got twenty three, but it's still open for another forty eight days, guys. And there's still some uh, stretch goals to get. So. Uh, let me, let's see, we've unlocked the, uh, the inter, uh, introductory adventure and it is going to be available for print on demand. Uh, also, uh, it, the handbook, uh, which is going to have 12 superheroes and villains in it from, uh, his own Zenith comic universe. Uh, along with the print-on-demand for that, and STLs that are unlocked also. So those of you who like to do 3D printing, those are available, will be available to you. The next one is going to be a the Whimsy cards, and these are going to be an additional uh, thing is uh, where you can... It's going to be kind of like a a draw, and fate will will help you out for you know you you get one column shift to whatever it is, um, and then they will uh, provide uh, at three thousand or thirty thousand, I should say, uh, provide that to everyone also, and then you know there's some more stuff. There's more things, uh, more adventures that he's got ready that he's going to write up. Uh, some beautiful art. So definitely make sure you check that out, guys. We're going to be playing this uh, next week. And I kind of wish he would have given us the option he gave his group last night. Which was a completely random roll up. I did not. And then, and then working some stuff in, but instead we've got someone who's going to try to get dead people to where they need to go, and Darkwing Duck. 
in, in, in me, burning things on fire. And Cody, a mystic. So yeah, make sure you come and join us next week. Uh, definitely want to thank everybody for uh, being here with us tonight. This is, I, I will say, this is the first part of a 10-part series. So we're good. After we get through with uh, the the playing and becoming heroic, we are going to come back to this and uh, keep on going. So if you are enjoying this, make sure you hit the like, hit the subscribe button. Links to every member of the Table Breakers crew is in my uh, mine and Kai's description. Make sure they're, they're tiny URLs. It's just to help me out so I don't have to go in and, and re-link everything every time that we do these. But, you know, definitely make sure that, that you're following following these great folks. Uh, we hope to have Connell back here in about five weeks. Jade, we're hoping to get him back eventually. Uh, he he is out because he's working 60 to 80 hours a week. Or, uh, yeah, six, about 50 to 60 hours a week, I should say. Um, and he's a very tired man. <laughs> he, he's enjoying the money, but he's a very tired man. So, uh, like I said, make sure you hit the like, hit the subscribe. Join us next week with our good friend, uh, Bear the Gen X GM. Thank you much for joining us, and we will catch you next time. Have a great night. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>